Welcome to the lecture for Psych 310. We'll be talking about mood disorders. Uh, so before we can uh, start talking about the disorders, we need to uh, clarify some terms. We're talking about uh, emotions, about affect, and about mood. Uh, and some people use these words interchangeably, but they really have, uh, especially for uh, psychologists, they have different meanings. Uh, first off, emotion uh, is defined as a state of arousal defined by subjective states of feeling. Right? So it's both this kind of physiological arousal, depending on the pattern of physiological arousal, will be slightly different depending on what emotion um, you're experiencing. Right? The, the rate at which your heart rate speeds up or slows down is different depending on what that emotional experience is. But it's not just this physiological reaction, right? it's also the subjective state, and that means you feel happy, you feel angry, not just, oh, I feel my heart speeding up. Oh, I'm I'm heart fast right now. No, it's I'm happy or I'm angry, which both both of which may involve an increased heart rate, but very different subjective states of being. Uh, but so that's emotion. It's how you're feeling and some physiological arousal together. Affect uh, then is the pattern of observable behaviors like facial expressions that are associated with subjective feelings. So smiling, frowning. So it's the uh, outward display. Uh, of your emotional experience is, is what we talk about when we talk about uh, someone's affect. They have a restricted range of affect. They're not showing a lot of different emotions. Which usually the supposition is that uh, your affect matches your uh, uh, emotional experience. So if you have a restricted range of affect, there's a supposition that you have a restricted range of emotional experience, which may or may not be true depending on the, the situation. Okay, so emotion, how you feel, how you uh, uh, feel at a given instant. Affect is your display uh, of that feeling state, and then mood is a pervasive and sustained emotional response that may affect a person's perceptions. Um, so uh, you know something happens and it makes you and you feel happy when it happens, and that's your emotional experience. If you continue to feel happy over some amount of time, how much time? Uh, there's no set amount, but for a while, let's say, um, then we we talk about that no longer being just the experience of emotion. Oh, I'm feeling, uh, I felt happy when I when this happened. I'm in a good mood now. I'm in a happy mood. I'm in a pleasant mood. So it's a sustained emotional uh, response, not just a kind of a, 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 um, a circumscribed experience that uh, you're happy and then you come back to normal um, uh, you, you stop feeling that emotion, you stop having the physiological arousal, and the subjective state also decreases. Uh, mood is basically just longer. Right? So there are lots of different moods uh, we, we could talk about, but we're really focused on two. Uh, we're talking about mood disorders. Uh, depression and elation. Right? If people have a very depressed mood, or if they have an elated, uh, um, kind of high energy mood. Um, you could consider think, well, why isn't there a, a guilty mood uh, um, disorder or angry mood disorder? And you might have a good point. There might should be uh, uh, disorders if people have uh, these kind of character uh, that are characterized by problematic mood states related to other things other than depression or elation. But so far, that doesn't seem to be the case, uh, at least in. Not to the extent that they're not, those experiences aren't captured better by other things. Uh, with the exception, I would argue, of uh, anger. Um, right now, people who have kind of angry outbursts, uh, if they don't have uh, depression to go along with it, or something else that might explain it, like PTSD, they're given the label of impulse control disorder. Which may or may not be the best uh, description of what their problem is. If their really problem is uh, pervasive uh, fe feelings of anger, then that sounds more like angry mood disorder. Um, something to consider for maybe the next DSM. Okay, so um, we all experience emotions, we all display affect, and we all um, experience different mood states, right? And most of us, you're not in the same mood state all the time. Your mood changes. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll focus on depression relation, but how do you know when you uh, cross the line from normal mood variation variability changes to uh, something that's clinically significant, a disturbance, right? You know, so can you be in too good of a mood? So oh, I'm really happy. I'm feeling excited and jazzed and all this energy. I feel like I can do anything. 
at what point does feeling too good become mania? And we say, oh, that's now you're having a manic episode. There, there's a problem. Uh, on the count of that, how sad is too sad? You know, if um, you know somebody close to you dies, or or you um, lose some opportunity, uh, or you experience some failure, and you're upset by it, and you're really sad, and you feel really down, and you don't feel like doing anything. For you know, for most of us, say, well, if you didn't feel sad, we would question uh, uh, your your mental health, right? Well, that's that's why this really horrible thing happened. Why aren't you upset? Aren't you sad? You should be sad, right? It makes sense to us to feel sad up to a point, right? But at some point, feeling sad becomes pathological. So, what is the line between normal and pathological in terms of uh, these moods? Hopefully, uh, you've uh, shouted at the computer, there is no line. <laughs> and I, I would agree with you. In reality, there's no clear line demarcating the two. Um, uh, we make these uh, lines using our diagnostic criteria, but they're just these kind of subjective uh, judgments that we impose uh, because we need to uh, have some sort of decision points. Uh, but in reality, there isn't a clear line where you can obviously say, okay, we are almost there, almost there, okay, boom, now it's pathological. But um, there are some indicators uh, of the transition between normal uh, uh, to uh, something that's maybe pathological or clinically significant. So not that, okay, well, if these things are there, then you definitely know. But if you're trying to decide, okay, this person's been really sad for a while now, might this be a problem or might this be, be uh, normal, healthy sadness? A couple of things to, to think about in, in reaching a decision. So things that influ should influence your decision. One, uh, the degree to which the mood is pervasive across situations and over time. So if somebody um, just has something bad happen and they're really sad and they're feeling really down and they go, oh, I'm gonna, uh, it's been a couple of days, maybe I can cheer them up, maybe we'll go uh, see a funny movie um, and maybe go, uh, go to the, the carnival. And if they can go the movie, and eventually there's really funny stuff in the movie. You want to see like The Hangover, and they, they laughed. Uh, and you go, okay, well, they're probably were experiencing a normal level of sadness, and they're able to still experience these positive emotions and to be able to feel good when doing fun things. Uh, if not, so if even during uh, situations, so situations where uh, you would expect mood to be lifted because you're doing fun enjoyable things and the mood doesn't lift it's pervasive across situations that's one hint that you might be moving toward kind of the, the pathological uh, the disturbance end of the spectrum uh, and similarly over time there's just this general expectation that um, your mood should return to baseline of oh, I'm not feeling super happy or super sad right now I'm just kind of I'm here I'm okay because that's what we uh, expect. So if you stay in any particular mood state uh, for too long, so the mood is pervasive over time, then that's an indication that something is off and you're stuck somehow and not able to return to uh, um, baseline or not able to experience a different mood. Okay, uh, The change in mood may come out of nowhere or may be disproportionate to circumstances. Um, here we're thinking mostly about uh, mania to where so, you know, if, if you won the lottery and you, you get super happy and you feel on top of the world, that didn't come out of nowhere. You just won the, the lottery. That, that's awesome. But now if you're just, uh, you wake up in the morning, you're ready to go to work and then um, making some toast and all of a sudden you feel awesome on top of the world and there's nothing to kind of explain that came out of nowhere, that might be indicative of some sort of pathological process. We're thinking kind of bipolar uh, disorder mania uh, type thing or disproportionate circumstances. So if uh, um, something happens, um, you know, you uh, you get a, a little uh, gift card thing in the mail from uh, Casa Ole, you know, a free $5 meal next time you come in. Oh, that's nice. And if you just have a little, ooh, that's nice. Normal little lift in mood. A free $5 is normal meal. But if you uh, feel like you just won the lottery, this is awesome. It's the best thing ever. I can conquer the world that would be a disproportionate mood response and something uh, there may be a clinical disturbance there same thing with sadness there's um, kind of culturally defined uh, levels of sadness that vary uh, by cultures uh, and also by individuals for this individual when something happens they get about this sad but sometimes for something that you should be oh on a scale of 1 to 10 a 6 
on the sadness. Uh, now they're they're at a ten. Okay, wow, something different. There's something different about this. They're too sad for what happened. You know, they, their dog died, and they're as sad as if their mom had died. There's something disproportionate about the level of mood uh, or emotion that they're experiencing. Um, another thing to consider uh, is if uh, the person's having uh, cognitive, somatic, or behavioral symptoms. Um, uh, so, in terms of, um, we've identified people as uh, having problematic mood for a variety of reasons. And among those people, there seems to be this pattern of they think a certain way that's different than when people uh, aren't suffering from mood disorders. Uh, they have um, certain somatic or uh, health uh, uh, concerns or physical changes, you know, loss of appetite, uh, difficulty sleeping, that they don't have when not in the mood disorder, and then certain behavioral symptoms. They, they act a certain way. They may uh, withdraw or they may go spend a lot of money, which is different than what people do when they don't suffer from uh, a mental disorder. So because these uh, patterns of thoughts, um, physical feelings, and behaviors are associated with the diagnosis, we we now think, okay, well, these may be signs that something pathological uh, is going on as well. And then last, uh, just the subjective experience of a different quality of the mood change. So um, something happens, maybe you get a raise at work and you feel uh, kind of good, and you're like, oh, that's nice. Or something happens, you get a raise at work and you go, oh, my God, this is awesome. And you go, wow, I'm, I'm really friggin' happy. That's weird. This is... This feels strange. I feel like like a like a god. I haven't felt this way before. Wow, this is different. You know, I've been happy before, but this this is happy. If there's this subjective experience that it's a different type of mood, sometimes uh, that might be an indicator uh, that we're we're talking about something other than just kind of normal uh, uh, variation in in mood or affect or emotion. Okay, so keeping all these things in mind. Uh, will help you when we talk about these criteria because when we talk about the criteria for mood disorders, most people uh, say, can I point to the symptoms and go, oh yeah, I've had that, I've had that, I've had that. And yeah, you probably have because like all things we'll talk about, these are um, pieces of human experience that when certain things happen uh, and we, uh, the things we just talked about in terms of looking for those certain clues, um, the, uh, the mood, uh, the emotion becomes uh, too strong, unresponsive to change, or is associated with a certain pattern of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, and, and then it causes impairment or distress, then it reaches this level that we say, okay, that's a problem, and uh, we're going to name that problem, we're going to name that problem a disorder. Right? But again, it's on the continuum of human experience, but at the point that it's a problem, we label it uh, a psychological disorder. Um, so before we can talk about the uh, dis the mood disorders we first need to define uh, the mood episodes um, and you can't be diagnosed with a mood episode oh you suffer from a major depressive episode you know that's code 350.24 no but all of the mood disorders uh, to some degree the diagnosis is about the presence or absence of certain mood episodes so once you can understand what the mood episodes are what the criteria to have a mood episode uh, um, are then you can understand um, the criteria for the different mood disorders. Uh, and, the, and the different uh, mood episodes are major depressive episode, uh, manic episode, hypomanic episode, and mixed episode. So we'll start, obviously, we're talking about major depressive episodes. Do you have some criteria for that? So, five or more of the following are present during the same two-week period and represent a change from previous functioning. At least one symptom is depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure which is also referred to as anhedonia. Right. So uh, you have to have a cluster of symptoms, and there has to be for at least two weeks. Why two weeks? Well, people raised their hands and, and voted. They said, they said it sounded like a good amount of time. Some amount of time is required because uh, whenever uh, we experience difficulty in life uh, and are sad, these symptoms often come with sadness and disappointment. Um, so there's nothing uh, particularly pathological about the symptoms, but if they persist, then it indicates that there's a problem, and we call it pathology. Right? So, but for depressive episode, it's a two-week period. Um, it represents a change from previous functioning, so you're not just kind of always this way. You were, you were at some normal mood or maybe elevated mood, and then, boom, there's a change for two weeks 
or more, um, frequently more. Um, and then one of the symptoms has to be either depression or anhedonia. Notice that to be diagnosed with major, dep major depressive episode and subsequently major depressive disorder, you don't have to uh, have depressed mood. You could have just this anhedonia and some other symptoms, which anhedonia is that loss of interest or pleasure. So you no longer want to do things uh, that you used to enjoy doing that were fun. You don't want to uh, hang out with people, but you also you don't you don't want to sit at home and play video games by yourself, even though you, you maybe you love video games. You no longer find pleasure in life, right? And that in itself uh, is enough for kind of the key feature of depression, and not necessarily depressed mood. Okay. Um, okay, so of all the symptoms, depressed mood almost all the time, and in youth, uh, you can also instead of having uh, de depressed mood, uh, it could be irritability um, uh, to be diagnosed with a major depressive disorder. So again, you don't have to have depressed mood to be diagnosed with depression, which I always find uh, interesting. Uh, and also another kind of note for these symptoms uh, to meet criteria. Uh, most symptoms must be present uh, nearly every day uh, or um, all day for a significant period of time. Um, so we have depressed uh, mood, or then the second one, that diminished interest or pleasure in almost all activities and almost almost all the time, so it's the anhedonia. So you have to have one of those two, one, one or two. You might have both, um, but then you have to have um, four others. Uh, significant change in weight or appetite, uh, and interestingly, it can go either way: increase in weight, decrease in weight, increase in appetite, decrease in appetite. Just a change uh, in those, and that would be, you know, a somatic symptom. Uh, insomnia or s hypersomnia. So again, sleep difficulties, but not one way or the other. It could be either way, um, which again um, should kind of make you think: Wow, th if this is clearly a, a disease process. Wouldn't it be the same that, well, this disease causes you to sleep too much or causes you to not sleep? Well, it depends on the individual, uh, which indicates that it's not, maybe not as close to a disease as something like chicken pox, as we might, uh, might hope to believe. Uh, similarly, uh, psychomotor symptoms, including psychomotor agitation, or <laughs> the opposite would be retardation. So either kind of moving really fast and uh, uh, jittery or very kind of slow moving uh, and lethargic and... Um, and this is for really uh, severe depression. People just, um, not just that they don't feel like doing anything, but they really, you ask them to pass something and they reach very slowly, grab the thing, and slowly hand it to you. Uh, fatigue or loss of energy. Uh, feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. So kind of a combination of cognitive emotional symptoms here. Uh, beyond the depression, also maybe feeling uh, guilty for things. It's all my fault. Uh, and, or I'm no good, so kind of an impact on how you see yourself, uh, self-image. Um, diminished ability to, to think or concentrate or uh, pronounced indecisiveness, so you can't decide what to do. Oh, I don't know, what should I do? Should I uh, go see the doctor and not see the doctor? I don't, I don't know, I, I, I can't think straight right now. I'm so depressed, I can't think straight. Uh, and then in some individuals, recurrent thoughts of death, uh, suicidal ideation, which suicidal ideation is thinking about suicide, uh, suicidal attempt, or a specific plan for suicide. Uh, so of these nine, you have to have uh, five, but it can be any five. So again, uh, two people with uh, uh, that are experiencing a major depressive episode might only have uh, one symptom in common. It might, the other symptoms might be all uh, totally different from each other. Um, but you notice if you look at uh, these symptoms, you can probably categorize each symptom into one of three uh, uh, categories. Either a cognitive symptom, a somatic or vegetative symptom, or a behavioral symptom. Uh, and it seems that the somatic symptoms are the ones that are, are most diagnostic. They're, most, they're the ones that, if present, it's uh, their most reliable indicators that you suffer from a major depressive episode and possibly major depressive uh, disorder. So the things like the, um, the s sleep problems and the change in weight or appetite, um, those are better predictors of depression than feelings of worthlessness. Okay. Uh, so those somatic symptoms are better predictors. 
some other symptoms that don't apply to the diagnosis but are, are common features to major depressive episode. Uh, tearfulness, which you might expect to be a diagnostic criteria, but it's not. Uh, brooding or rumination, so kind of thinking uh, kind of a little bit obsessively about your problems. Uh, worry, which we also see in generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, other somatic complaints, uh, headaches, uh, joint pain, back pain. Um, so one thing I'd like for you to think about as you uh, kind of peruse the, these symptoms is does a negative mood, so again you have to have either that negative mood or anhedonia, so does that mood symptom uh, cause the other symptoms or are all the symptoms including mood the uh, um, the result of some disease or process. So what I'm wondering is do you think you know if you have depressed mood does it make sense that um, you are gonna have a hard time uh, concentrating and you're gonna uh, feel worthless. Is that caused by having a depressed mood or are both of those things caused by some chemical imbalance or some other process? Right. So, does do, does one sy symptom affect another, or do all these symptoms can they possibly co-vary, but they vary together because they're all influenced by the same process or disease? Okay. So that's the, the first part of the criteria for uh, a major depressive episode. Those are the, the the diagnostic symptoms, and then you have some some rule out stuff. Right. So it's not a mi mixed episode, so you have those symptoms, and the mixed episode basically is a combination of depressive and manic symptoms. So you have these depressive symptoms, but you don't don't also have enough m manic symptoms to meet criteria for a mixed episode. So it's just the depression, not both. Uh, like with most disorders, there's clinically significant distress or impairment, uh, and the symptoms are not due to a substance or general medical condition, and it's not bereavement. Right, so uh, if you've uh, recently lost someone and you have all of these symptoms for two weeks, we say, well, that's that's bereavement. You're sad because you lost someone. And, and in our culture, we say it's acceptable to experience uh, a depressive episode, basically. We're not going to pathologize it uh, if it's bereavement. Unless your symptoms persist after two months or are severe. So if you lose someone and you have all these symptoms, we're not going to call it a major depressive episode unless they're really bad or if they last longer than two months. So we've kind of, uh, um, the psychiatric community and psychological community uh, together have said, okay, you have two months to, to be really sad about losing someone. After that, uh, you need to have uh, fewer symptoms uh, or be over it all together. Otherwise, it's pathological and we now put you in the box that there's a problem. How do they determine two months? Uh, they voted by raising their hands. Okay. And let's move on to manic episodes. So uh, a manic episode is a distinct period of abnormally or persistently elevated expansive or irritable mood lasting at least one week or shorter if hospitalized. So uh, it's either expansive mood, which is feeling really good, or it can be irritable mood, which, if you remember from talking about a major depressive episode moments ago, if you're a youth, irritable mood could also be diagnosed as a major depressive episode. So same symptom could be uh, associated with two seemingly distinct, maybe even opposite, mood episodes. But again, you, there's more symptoms involved, so it's not that, that simple. Usually you can tell the difference. Um, but So either feeling really good or fi feeling irritable. Uh, in, uh, for a major depressive episode, it was two weeks. For manic, it's one week. Uh, why the if shorter, if hospitalized? Well, because usually, or not usually, but frequently, uh, when people experience uh, mania, uh, they get into trouble. They're feeling really good, they feel they can do anything, and so they try to do anything, but they're, they're not as superhuman as they think, and so they uh, get in trouble with the police or uh, end up in the hospital. And once in the hospital, uh, they give you drugs which make you not feel so good, uh, and they, they take away your mania. So the idea is that 
you uh, you wouldn't you only had the manic symptoms for three days, but then you got hospitalized. They doped you up and you stopped feeling good. You would have continued to have those symptoms if they hadn't given you the drugs. So you still can meet criteria because you were hospitalized and and treated. They don't and they don't say treated, but they say if hospitalized. The assumption being that if hospitalized, they're gonna uh, dope you up and take away your your mania. Okay, so. Uh, in depression, it was five uh, symptoms or more. Uh, in mania, it's uh, fewer, three. Uh, four, uh, if irritable. So uh, irritability is thought to be not as uh, um, defini definitively characteristic of mania as the expansive mood. So if you have irritability, you have to have more symptoms to make up for the fact that, oh, it's not quite what we think of as being mania, but it's maybe in there. Um, could be uh, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity, so you think you're awesome. Uh, decreased need uh, for sleep, which in uh, major depressive episodes, you could have hypersomnia or insomnia. In insomnia, you can't go to sleep. But with a major depressive episode, you want to go to sleep. You're tired. You just can't go to sleep. With mania, you don't want to go to sleep. You don't feel. You don't feel tired. You don't sleep. And you're fine. You still have your high energy, despite the fact that you didn't sleep or only slept for you know, maybe two hours. Uh, extra talkative or pressured speech. So talking more than usual and pressured speech would be how some people describe uh, my lectures when I start talking really fast like this. And, and you, uh, it seems as if they're trying to get the words out so fast before they're going to figure out what they're going to say. That would be pressured speech. or People are just speaking uh, as if there's pressure pushing the words out uh, uh, behind them. Uh, flight of ideas or racing thoughts uh, and obviously we can't see people's ideas uh, but we uh, assume a flight of ideas from usually tangential speech so they'll be talking about oh you know uh, I decided to go to the mall and buy uh, buy some new shorts and when I was there oh and you know what I saw the guy at the Slurpee thing um, had cookies on sale you know what? I really think we ought to make some cookies sometime because I really love cookies you know when I was a kid I was a Girl Scout and so they go from one thing to the other uh, uh, very quickly, and there's lots of ideas going to be going as if their their brain is working uh, at at hyper speed. Uh, distractibility, so uh, having difficulty obviously paying attention, um, which uh, is related in you know major depressive episode. You could have that uh, difficulty concentrating, but it's a different. There's a, a qualitative difference between distractibility and just difficulty concentrating. Difficulty concentrating, you're trying to concentrate, but you can't focus because there's like you feel cloudy and hazy distractibility uh, you're focusing and you're very intent and then something catches your eye and now you're intent and focused on that something else comes in your intent and focused on that which is different than not being able to focus at all it's a change of focus frequent change of focus think of it that way uh, increase in goal directed activity uh, now this is the, the kind of the good symptom that people uh, like to have you get a lot of stuff done uh, for some people that have have mania, so uh, goal directed activity, um, so not purposefully uh, just having energy and going or, uh, about uh, getting nothing done, but uh, you know getting your house painted, uh, writing a term paper in in one sitting, um, cleaning your house from top to bottom twice. That would be an increase in goal directed uh, activity. Um, and the one that usually gets people in trouble would be the excessive involvement in pleasurable activities that are dangerous. So uh, going on kind of uh, sexual escapades and uh, seeking out a lot of sensation, uh, seemingly. Uh, uh, shopping sprees, uh, gambling sprees, going out spending uh, lots of money, uh, doing dangerous things, you know, uh, surfing on top of vans, things like that, uh, sometimes associated uh, with mania. Um, okay, so those are the criteria for, for mania, and, and sometimes uh, people uh, really, uh, they like mania. Um, if they get that kind of expansive mood, uh, and then grandiosity, and the increase in goal-directed goal activity, where they feel really good, they get a lot of stuff done, and they think they're doing great. Sometimes, for other people, or even for the same people at different times, their mania may be more characterized by irritability and the uh, distractibility uh, and the um, the flight of ideas where they just feel like they're going a mile a minute and they're not getting anything done and it can be kind of scary to be uh, uh, manic. So the same mood episode can be qualitatively different, a different subjective experience for different people or for the same person at different times. Again, the, the same rule-out criteria. Uh, it's 
the, these symptoms don't meet criteria for a mixed episode, so you don't have some depressive symptoms in there too. It's just the, the manic ones. Um, and then the, the symptoms cause impairment, require hospitalization, or include psychotic features. So uh, this kind of gets the point that sometimes people that are, are, are manic, uh, especially if they experience uh, grandiosity, may experience uh, delusions, delusions of reference, where they think that they're somehow uh, special or that uh, God is sending them messages. Uh, and it's not psychosis. It's just something that happens for some people uh, in the context uh, of mania. But uh, again, so you have to have this other stuff, not just because if you just had, oh, I feel really good, I got a lot of stuff done, you think, well, geez, that's not a disorder, that's awesome. Well, what's not awesome is when you when you're meet criteria for mania, it causes impairment. So you're not getting the right things done, or you may be leaving some things unattended, or you know you didn't you didn't sleep, eat or drink for uh, uh, you know five days, and so you're dehydrated and get put in the hospital. That's not not good for you. So it's causing some problems, or has psychotic features. Oops. Uh, and then the last one would be the symptoms are not due to a general medical condition or a substance. So you're not just high on uh, cocaine, which you know some of these symptoms would be consistent with um, um, intoxication with uh, cocaine or or possibly some other stimulants, uh, methamphetamines. So it's not intoxication, and it's not um, a medical condition that's causing uh, these symptoms. It's something else, this mental disorder. Okay, so we've talked about uh, a major depressive episode. We've talked about a manic episode. And we always said, okay, and it's not a mixed episode. So let's talk about what a mixed episode is. Uh, a mixed episode is when uh, criteria are met for a manic episode and a major depressive episode for one week. So those same criteria. So you have to have you know, five of the depressive symptoms and uh, three of the manic symptoms. But it only has to be a week. It doesn't have to be two weeks, like for a depression. Um, and then it causes problems. So it causes distress uh, or impairment. Uh, and the symptoms uh, are not due to a general medical condition or substance. Um, so within this period of week, you have all these symptoms. And it could be that, uh, you know, for three days you have... Uh, some, and in the next three days you have the other, or m more commonly, you have uh, this kind of combination on a daily basis, where you are feeling uh, uh, really driven, but also suicidal. Um, so a little more complicated than, than either disorder uh, alone. So we have major depressive episode, uh, manic episode, mixed episode, and then the, the last one we'll talk about would be a hypomanic episode, which, as the name implies, hypo uh, meaning less, less than manic. So this is a distinct period of persistently elevated expansive or irritable mood. Sound familiar? All right, that's the same as the definition for mania, but for four days instead of one week, uh, and that is different from uh, typical non-depressed mood. So it's not just not being depressed. It's different than that. Um, it's feeling good or irritable. Um, and you have to have at least three of the symptoms from criteria B for manic episodes. So uh, all the things we talked about before in terms of the, the flight of ideas, the decreased need for sleep, the distractibility. You have to have three symptoms of mania. Right? Uh, the episode has to be uncharacteristic and unequivocal change in functioning. So it's not just, uh, uh, I'm feeling a little better. And that would be, you know, unequivocal. And it, it has to be uncharacteristic. So it's not like, okay, uh, usually I'm f after I feel depressed for a while, then I start to feel a little bit better. That would be characteristic of you. Oh, yeah, of course. Well, you typically feel a little better after your depression. This is uh, that coming out of uh, uh, nowhere um, uh, uh, idea that makes it um, pathological. Uh, and then the change in mood and functioning is observable to others. So other people can say, wow, you look you look really kind of happy or wow you're really irritable so it's not just this not just a subjective feeling it has to be uh, um, able to be perceived by others uh, and here's the important one that distinguishes it from uh, a manic episode the symptoms are not severe enough to cause impairment or hospitalization okay so it's less time than a manic episode and it doesn't cause impairment you don't get hospitalized and again 
symptoms not due to a general medical condition or substance. So if it doesn't cause impairment, why would it be a problem? And the answer is, uh, it's not. If you experience hypomania uh, by itself, uh, without any other mood episodes, it's not a disorder. There is no hypomanic disorder. That's uh, good for you. Hey, you get to feel a little bit manic, but not so much that it causes problems. You know, that's, that's somebody who's uh, lucky, I would say. Um, but it's a mood episode because in combination with other mood episodes, uh, it helps differentiate and distinguish between different mood disorders, which we'll see uh, uh, shortly. Okay. So the mood disorders. Major depressive disorder. Characterized by one or more major depressive episodes without a history of a manic, mixed, or hypomanic episodes. Right. So major depressive disorder is five or more of those symptoms that cause uh, impairment or distress, not due to a medical condition, yada, yada. So all the stuff we talked about with that uh, either depressed mood or anhedonia plus the other combination of somatic cognitive behavioral symptoms. But you've never had a manic episode, never had a mixed episode, so you never had some manic symptoms, and never had hypomanic episodes. Because if you had any of those things, then it goes from being a uh, major depressive disorder to being one of the bipolar disorders. Right? And we, think we talk about uh, bipolar and unipolar uh, because originally there was this assumption that uh, mood was on, uh, had this polarity of good mood uh, and depressed mood were opposite ends of the same continuum, which we now uh, understand isn't very accurate, especially given the fact that people can have mixed episodes. How can you be at both ends of the, of the same pole at once? It doesn't make sense. There's going to be two different uh, continuums where you can be both sad and happy at the same time sometimes. Um, but for major depressive disorder, unipolar depression, the idea is you just have the, the sad feelings or, or the irritable feelings without the other things that are characteristic of, of mania or hypomania uh, in any way, shape, or form. And not just now. Sometimes, okay, right now you're feeling depressed and you're not feeling manic at all. You've never been manic and never been hypomanic. Okay. So, bipolar 1, there's bipolar 1 and bipolar 2. Bipolar 1 is one or more manic episodes or mixed episodes. So at some point you met criteria for a manic or mixed episode. <coughs> uh, and then a major, a major depressive episode may be present or past. So either you, uh, you know, may were manic at one point in time and now you're depressed, or you were depressed before and now you're manic, or you're manic and you've never been depressed. Right? You don't have to have been depressed to have bipolar 1. It's extremely rare for anybody to have mania and never experience depression. Some of these people had experienced the mania first, so they're manic and like, well, you've ever had been depressed? No. Wait long enough, give them a, a year, and they'll, they will experience a major depressive episode. So mania doesn't typically happen by itself. It doesn't happen in the absence of uh, depression Typically, it, it can happen, but it, it's rare. But for di diagnosis sake, all you have to really have is a manic episode or a mixed episode. So you have to be manic at some point, and it's it's bipolar one. So bipolar two, different than bipolar one, you have to have a major depressive episode. So one or more major depressive episodes with at least one hypomanic episode. So Remember, for depression, if you had a depressive episode, uh, you could never have had a hypomanic episode. If you are depressed now and were hypomanic at some point, it's now bipolar 2. Right? Or if you're uh, um, hypomanic now and were depressed at some point, if you were depressed first, you meet criteria for major depressive disorder. Once you become hypomanic, now your disorder changes. The label changes. You no longer suffer from major depressive disorder. You now suffer from bipolar 2. We just didn't know it until you had this experience of hypomania. Um, but then it's distinguished from bipolar 1 in that you have no history of a manic or mixed episode. So if you have full-blown mania or a full-blown mixed episode, it's bipolar 1. If you don't, if you just have hypomania and you have uh, depression, then it's bipolar 2. So it's conceivable uh, a person could have uh, meet criteria at different times in their life for all three disorders, right? They could 
ser suffer from a major depressive episode and be diagnosed with major depressive disorder. And then, uh, a few months later, they develop symptoms of hypomania. They have, you know, uh, five days of, of manic symptoms, but then those symptoms stop after five days without any medication. So now they, they've had a major depressive episode. Now they have a hypomanic episode, and they're diagnosed with bipolar 2. Uh, keep going through time. Maybe they have another major depressive episode. Maybe not. But at, at some point, they have a full-blown manic episode or a mixed episode at which time their diagnosis changes again from bipolar 2 to bipolar 1. Okay. So, major depressive disorder, just depression, nothing else. Bipolar 1, you have to have a uh, manic or mixed episode. Bipolar 2, it's a combination of depression and hypomania and can't have had a manic or mixed episode. Okay, so those are the, the disorders that are characterized by um, mood episodes, these kind of discrete periods of mood disturbance, right? which typically uh, uh, you have normal mood, then you get depressed or hypomanic or manic, and then it comes back to normal mood or goes to, or goes to another pathological mood. But you don't stay depressed forever. You don't continue to show all the symptoms of major depressive episode for... Uh, all your life. You know, most people, it's 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 in a matter of, of months, month, two months. Some people, as long as a year, micro year for that long. But it's rare. The body has this homeostatic mechanism that won't let you be depressed, fully depressed, or fully manic for too long. But you can be less depressed and 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 uh, kind of switching between moods to a, a lesser degree for a longer period of time, and that's why we have these other disorders that don't involve mood episodes. Um, so, this thymic disorder, this is somebody who's chronically depressed uh, for at least two years, usually longer, um, but there's uh, no major depressive episode during those two years. Uh, so either you've never had a major depressive episode, or you had a major depressive episode, uh, you had, you recovered to where you no longer met criteria for a major depressive episode, and then you went on to have a period uh, of two years uh, where you had depressed mood um, nearly every day. But it didn't get so bad that you were having a major depressive episode. So you didn't get suicidal. Uh, maybe you, you were able to sleep okay. You just really felt sad all the time. That would be this thymic disorder. Um, and people can be diagnosed with both this thymic disorder and major depressive disorder. Uh, when they are, it's typically referred to as double depression. Uh, it's typically people that, uh, and it can happen two ways. It can be you have the, the stymia first, and then eventually you meet criteria for a major depressive episode, and you get the diagnosis of uh, major depressive disorder on top of it. Or it could be um, you have fairly low level depression, but not too bad. You experience a major depressive episode, and after that, you don't have full mood recovery, and you continue to have some depressive symptoms for this, this two year uh, or longer period. Um, when we think about dysthymia, uh, it almost feels like a like a personality uh, disorder, uh, almost like a trait. Somebody who's just always kind of sad and down. Talk about the kind of the Eeyore uh, personality. People, that, well, I don't know. It probably is not going to work out. It's very kind of low energy all the time, but not not in, not in kind of a crisis depression. Just chronic low level depression, um, but beyond just a little sad. Okay. Uh, so that would be kind of the, the chronic counterpart to major depressive disorder. And then the chronic counterpart to uh, uh, the bipolar disorders would be uh, cyclothymic disorder. With cyclothymic disorder, you have chronic uh, fluctuating mood disturbance with hypomanic symptoms and depressive symptoms for two years, uh, or just one year if you're under 18. Um, so this is where you have some depressive symptoms, but not enough to have a, a major depressive episode, and some hypomanic symptoms, but not enough to get a full... Um, hypomanic uh, episode, because you know, it's no mood episodes present, uh, sorry, except for a hypomanic episode during those two years. So you, you've never been fully manic, and you've never been uh, fully depressed, never met criteria for a, a major depressive episode, a mixed episode, or a manic episode. Uh, maybe a hypomanic episode, because again, that's not that pathological. Um, but chronically going between moods of uh, kind of sad, kind of happy, kind of sad, kind of happy. 
um, with this, these fluctuations uh, of mood over a long period of time. So this real kind of affective instability would be cyclothymic disorder. Okay. So on top of that, for the, the mood disorders, you can add these uh, specifiers. And we add specifiers to give kind of clarity to, okay, person meets criteria for this disorder, and here's some other information about this person's experience with that disorder. Uh, so things that you might need to specify to communicate to other uh, caregivers what, what's going on with this person. Uh, single episode or recurrent. Um, to be considered separate mood episodes, there has to be... Um, uh, at least two months, a two-month space between, okay, you felt really sad here, you felt kind of okay, and then really sad again. It has to be two months of that, uh, um, uh, between the two episodes, to call them two episodes, not just one episode where you started to feel a little better, then it went back into that same episode. Right? Um, which, you know, once you've experienced one episode, you're more likely to have uh, uh, another one, and once you have two, you're more likely to have three than somebody who's had one or, or none, and it kind of increases uh, beyond that. Uh, you specify what the most recent episode was, so most recent episode, um, manic or hypomanic or uh, depressed, and that would be for the, the, the bipolar disorders. Uh, specify the severity, mild, moderate, uh, severe, and then with or without um, psychotic features. Uh, and the severity is based on uh, both the number of symptoms and the level of impairment. And it's not, okay, well, if it's uh, six instead of five, it's severe. It's, it's up to a uh, clinician's judgment what constitutes uh, severity. Okay. Uh, another specifier that you, you might uh, um, apply would be uh, chronic, so major depressive disorder uh, uh, chronic. Um, and this is for those people who... Uh, meet criteria for a mood episode for a long period of time. So for major depressive disorder, um, chronic, they would have met a, a criteria for a major depressive episode for two years, which is a very long time. Again, usually it's a matter of months for, for mood episodes. Um, and then different features. Uh, it could be uh, with catatonic features. Um, and this can happen with uh, major, major depressive episode, manic episode, mixed episode. Um, in catatonic, catatonic features, things like you know motoric immobility, uh, catalepsy, stupor, um, where you know they can't move, or the opposite, excessive motor uh, activity that is apparently uh, purposeless. So they're you know moving the arm uh, back and forth, back and forth without you know they're not fanning themselves, but the arms just kind of going. Uh, extreme negativism, which is uh, apparently motiveless resistance to all instructions. So you tell them, uh, hey, uh, can you pass me that uh, that can? Uh, and they say, sure. And then they don't move. And they're not trying to be a jerk. They just can't seem to will themselves to do things, even things that they would want to do. Can't make themselves get up you know, off the couch. Um, uh, mutism, so not talking. Uh, peculiarities of voluntary movement. Um, Prominent uh, grimacing, uh, echolalia and echopraxia, so repeating uh, noises made by others or repeating uh, uh, movements, um, which is pretty severe. Uh, with melancholic features, um, usually happens in a major depressed episode, uh, that's when you have the uh, uh, loss of pleasure or lack of reactivity to pleasurable stimuli, so you have the anhedonia. And... Um, Three other symptoms. Uh, you know, it's it's a different kind of depressed mood. Uh, qualitatively different. Uh, the depression is is worse in in the morning, uh, with melancholic features, with uh, kind of typical depression. You feel better in the morning, and then the mood worsens uh, as the day goes on. With melancholic features, uh, it's the opposite. Uh, these people wake up early. Uh, they have psychomotor disturbance, um, loss of appetite. Instead of uh, increase, instead of eating more, they eat less and they lose weight uh, and feel excessively guilty. Um, atypical features. Um, this is uh, like with major depressive episode. Uh, if they have um, mood reactivity, that would be atypical. So mood, acti mood reactivity means that their mood responds to stimuli. So uh, you know, if they laugh uh, at a joke during an depressive episode. That's atypical. That's interesting. That's different. Um, 
uh, weight gain, uh, increase in appetite, um, uh, hypersomnia. Usually, people uh, have difficulty sleeping. Um, leaden paralysis, which is kind of a catatonic feature, is another atypical feature. Uh, another one that you may be familiar with be with postpartum onset, uh, and this applies to any mood episode other than hypomanic. Um, um, it also applies to, to brief psychotic disorders we'll talk about in the future. But uh, with postpartum onset, which means uh, the onset of symptoms is within uh, four weeks uh, postpartum, you know, after giving birth. Uh, so postpartum depression isn't, uh, you know, a special kind of depression. It's depression that develops within four weeks of giving birth to a child. Um, so it's not a separate diagnosis, it's just a, a specifier. And then uh, if they're getting better, you can specify you know, in partial remission or in full remission. So some of the symptoms uh, um, not being met uh, anymore. Uh, and then with or without inter episode recovery. Let's talk before about how um, you're from one episode to the next. Sometimes you may go from a major depressive episode right into a hypomanic or manic episode, in which case you didn't have inter-episode recovery. You didn't go back to a normal mood in between. Some people might. Um, with seasonal pattern, uh, which is sometimes referred to as um, seasonal affective disorder, which isn't really a separate disorder. It's just a mood disorder with a seasonal pattern. Um, so... Uh, Usually with uh, depression, the depression comes or goes in a way that's predictable, predictably related to seasonal changes. Um, and the last one applies to, to just bipolar disorder uh, with rapid cycling. Uh, and people are like, oh, wow, they have bipolar disorder with rapid cycling. So oh, their mood changes, boom, boom, super fast, right? So they're real happy today, and tomorrow they'll be really sad. Um, so that's probably a lot of mood changes, huh? Well, to meet criteria for rapid cycling, the, the number of, of mood... Uh, episodes you need to have in one year. So over the course of 12 months, you have to have how many episodes do you think? You think, oh, well, probably at least one a month, so 12, maybe twice, maybe 24. Four. If you have four mood episodes within a year, four distinct mood episodes, you go from depression uh, to mania to depression inter episode recovery back to depression. You have four different mood episodes, distinct episodes in, in one year's time. That's rapid cycling. So again, rapid doesn't mean day in, day out. Rapid is four times in a year. Uh, so these mood episodes people talk about somebody who's uh happy today, sad tomorrow, that's probably not bipolar disorder unless they're tinkering with their medications. That's probably something more related to um somebody who's high in mood reactivity to where Something slightly good happens and they get really happy. Something slightly bad happens and they get really sad or really angry, which is something we'll see more when we talk about personality disorders uh, in the future. It helps distinguish some personality disorders from bipolar disorder. So that rapid cycling isn't day in, day out. It's, you know, um, after a certain number of weeks, you know, because again, to, have, to be manic, you have to have the symptoms for a full week at least. If you only were manic for one day, then it wasn't a manic episode, which means it, it's not bipolar disorder. Okay. Um, so when we talk about mood disorders, one of the things we need to talk about uh, uh, as well is, is suicide. Uh, and suicide doesn't occur only in individuals who suffer from mood disorders. In fact, uh, individuals with some other disorders uh, may be even at, at greater risk. Um, Somebody who has uh, schizophrenia, for example, is at a fairly high risk of suicide. Uh, so are individuals with um, anorexia. But it is commonly associated uh, with mood disorders. Uh, not everyone that commits suicide has a mood disorder, uh, but there certainly is, is a correlation. So what do we know about suicide? Well, we know there's some gender differences uh, in terms of uh, who attempts and who commits. Uh, men commit suicide more than women, so they're successful at committing suicide at a higher rate uh, than women. But women uh, attempt suicide more often. So more women attempt, but more men kill themselves. Uh, and this is usually because women, on average, use a less lethal means. People always think, okay, women use pills, men use guns. 
which there is uh, some truth to that. Men who attempt suicide tend to use a more lethal means than women who attempt suicide. So women who attempt suicide more often use pills. Women who commit suicide, do you think they also use pills? No. Women who commit suicide most often use guns. Because when you use a gun, it usually works. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. I've, I've worked with people that where it, it didn't. Uh, but, so, people think, oh, well, uh, my client's a woman. Um, no real need to worry about her uh, because she's just going to use pills. Well, she would most likely, statistically speaking, use pills. But if she uses a gun, as some women do, she will be successful. So, uh, I want to make sure people understand that, that, that uh, difference. Um, so who's the, the greatest risk group? We're going to look at kind of demographic uh, characteristics. Uh, men, women, old, young, um, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, uh, Pacific Islander. What do you think? Yeah. Most people are surprised that older white men uh, constitute the highest risk group uh, for suicide. Uh, and for, for many of them, it seems to be associated with... Uh, um, uh, combination of things. Uh, the loss of uh, identity related to change in work status, so after retiring or, or getting fired as, as they've gotten older, uh, but then also experiencing other uh, health difficulties uh, and being afraid that they can't uh, um, take care of themselves and don't want to be a burden uh, on their families uh, seems to increase their risk uh, of suicide uh, um, beyond other groups. Um, so for that group, we talk about some reasons, but in general, why do people uh, attempt suicide or uh, uh, commit suicide? And the answer is, I, I don't know. Um, and there are risk factors, and we'll talk about the risk factors, but the, 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 the truth is, sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes you can look back and kind of explain, okay, for this person, uh, here was, here's why and here's why. For some people, families and friends are left wondering, I, I just can't understand, I don't know why they did it. I know they were upset about something maybe, but it doesn't make sense that they would have chosen this path. It doesn't fit for them. And sometimes it doesn't fit. It, it, it's, it, sometimes it's not rational. Sometimes we can rationalize it, sometimes we can't. In terms of risk factors, uh, family history of, of suicide. So if someone else in your family has committed suicide, you're at a higher risk for also uh, committing suicide. And obviously it could be a lot of things contributing to that uh, as a risk factor. could be because of uh, some uh, inherited traits uh, related to impulsivity and depression. Uh, also some learning experience in terms of, okay, well, I remember Uncle Joe killed himself. So it's an option. It's, I know somebody who's done it. It's more real to me than somebody else who maybe hasn't never known anybody uh, who's, who's killed themselves. Uh, impulsivity seems to be uh, an important predictor of somebody that's going to uh, attempt suicide. Because one of the things we know about people who are suicidal is uh, they're frequently ambivalent about it. And not ambivalent in terms of, oh, I don't know if I want to do it. Ambivalent in terms of having strong feelings that I want, to I want to die, but also having strong feelings I want to live. And that's ambivalence, having strong feelings both ways. Um, so if you have strong feelings that you want to live and want to die, if you're not very impulsive, then you when you're feeling like, I want to die, you think, oh, I really want to die, but you know, I, I'm not going to do it yet, because yesterday I felt like I wanted to live, I'm going to wait and see how I feel tomorrow. If you're higher in impulsivity, when you feel like you want to die, screw it, let's do it, I'm going to do it now, and you, and you act on it, so you're more likely to act in those moments whenever you're, you're feeling more, uh, more suicidal, more like harming yourself. Um, uh, having an existing psychological disorder, so again, not everyone that commits suicide, um, was uh, suffering from or diagnosed with uh, a mental disorder, but being uh, diagnosed with a mental disorder does increase uh, the risk uh, of suicide uh, for a variety of disorders. Um, one of the pictures I talk, to, I talk about with um, therapists and training, one thing I really want people to assess for is uh, hopelessness, because it seems to, uh, you know, in, in clinical practice, be a really good predictor of who's going to attempt. So people talking about killing themselves, not that uncommon, especially in therapy, but once people say um, there's no hope, it will never get better, that's kind of the big red flag, because then they're about to commit to this course of action. Um, whereas if 
think, well, it, it seems like things can't get any better, but I don't know, maybe they will, but it seems like they can't. Now they're still in that ambivalence. There's still some hope that things might get better. And if, you can, if they can hang on to that hope, they can usually get through the period of darkness uh, and the risk of suicide um, goes down. But once they've lost hope, the risk of suicide is, is pronounced. Uh, another risk factor would be substance use and abuse, and this is kind of related to impulsivity. Again, with that ambivalence, if in those periods when someone is feeling suicidal, they're also high, well, when you're high, you have um, less ability to, um, uh, for, for most drugs, uh, less ability to um, regulate your impulses, so you become more impulsive, you make poor decisions, you think less clearly, and when you have all those things going, you're more likely to, to hurt yourself. And then, uh, lastly, uh, stressful life events. So, um, usually, again, like not always, but usually after someone has attempted suicide or committed suicide, people can point to, okay, well, he, this happened uh, a few weeks before or a month before. They, they lost their job. They lost their spouse. Um, they uh, were diagnosed with uh, this medical condition. There's some stressful event that made them think about wanting themselves. People who you know are happy go lucky and things are going well for them don't typically kill themselves. Um, so something bad uh, has happened. So again, but when something bad happens, it doesn't mean somebody's necessarily going to kill themselves. But it, it does increase the risk uh, of suicide. So what can you do uh, to prevent suicide? And well, you say, well, I'm not a therapist. I, I can't uh, do anything. Uh, not true. Uh, and I, I, I want to talk about things you can do, but I also want to make sure you understand that they're not things that you um, have to do or even should do. Um, if someone you know uh, is suicidal and and you try to stop them and and you don't and they commit suicide, it's not your fault, right? Especially if you're not a professional. But if you're a professional, you may honestly be at fault to some, some degree. You may have some liability. You may not. Some Because sometimes you just can't stop people, even if you're a professional. Especially if you're not professional, you may not be uh, fully trained or equipped uh, to prevent someone from hurting themselves. And when somebody has, like I said before, has lost all hope and made up their mind, uh, there's very little that can be done to, to stop them. But early in the process, there are some things uh, that you can do to le at least decrease the likelihood uh, that they'll act on it. So uh, before you can do something, you have to uh, assess. You have to gather information. So don't be afraid to ask. If someone you know, uh, uh, you suspect that they're suicidal, ask them directly. You don't, you don't say, you're, you're not thinking about killing yourself, are you? Right. No. That's not a direct question. Are you thinking about killing yourself? Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Do you want to die? Ask those questions directly. People think, oh, well, if I, if I ask and, and they weren't thinking about it, now they're going to think about it. I'll give them an idea. It'll be my fault. No, if, you're th if you suspect it, they're thinking about it. Whether or not they're going to do it, I don't know. But if you suspect it, they are thinking about it. You're not going to give them the idea. You're not going to cause the idea to be entered into their head. Okay? So uh, don't be afraid to ask directly. Um, Consider the risk factor. So all the things w we just talked about. Um, you know, what do you know about this person's family history? About how impulsive they are. Um, ask about uh, hopelessness. Are they using any drugs? What kind of stressful things have gone gone on uh, in their life um, uh, recently? Um, and then, in terms of assessing the the imminence uh, of of the risk. So, okay, I think they're at risk. How serious a risk are they going to do something soon? You want to ask about their plan. Do you have a plan? Okay, so you're thinking about killing yourself. You, you admit, you tell me you admit to, to thinking about it. Okay. How would you do it? Have you thought about how you would do it? And if they have a plan, it's a higher risk and a more imminent risk. If they say, oh, I don't know, sometimes I just drive down the road and I think I would, you know, pull off the bridge. That's not really a fully developed plan. They may be at risk, but it's a lower level of risk. If they say, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I've thought about it, and um, I'll I'll do it uh, on the weekend whenever uh, my roommate goes out of town, because uh, I don't want them to uh, to be there and, and walk in on me uh, or stop me. Um, and I, I've got some some pills uh, in in my cabinet. So if they have uh, 
a means and they've got a plan that involves, you know, some way that they won't be found uh, and to, they've planned on ensuring success of the attempt, that's higher danger and more imminent danger. And then also the type of method they're talking about um, um, is relevant to the danger. If they talk about, you know, I've got... Um, I've got a bottle of some uh, of Tylenol that I've been saving up, and I'm going to take the whole bottle. They may not realize it, but that's low risk. They're not going to kill themselves with a lot of Tylenol. They're going to have a very bad stomach ache, um, but not going to kill themselves, most likely, unless they have some rare blood disorder. If they have a gun, now we've got really a high risk. So uh, pills, risk, guns, high risk, uh, imminent threat. Um, uh, so you want to uh, assess these things in kind of conversational manner as best you can, being direct, uh, communicating a desire to, to help. Um, and then uh, if the risk is high, act. Attempt to remove the means uh, of killing themselves. So if they say, uh, you know, I've got a gun uh, in, in, my, in the drawer uh, beside my bed, you tell them, okay, is it okay with you if I take that? You know, because I know part of you doesn't want to do this. And can that part of you that doesn't want to do this tell me right now that I can go in there uh, and, and put it somewhere safe? And so you, and maybe they agree, maybe they don't, but you try to get them to, to give you their means. And not that they couldn't get another gun, but if you take away that immediate means, you're lowering, you're lowering the risk. So that's an immediate thing uh, you can do. Um, if, they, if they can't do if they can't do this, they say, no, I can't, I can't do that. I need it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. I just wanted to tell you goodbye. Um, then the the next step is going to be hospitalization, and and you can't hospitalize people. I can't hospitalize people, uh, but physicians and police can hospitalize someone. So you dial nine one one, and you wait with the person until they come. And if if it's somebody you care about a lot, you ride with them to the hospital uh, where they're going to be evaluated um, to make sure they get uh, taken care of. And then professionals get involved and take the burden uh, off of you to some degree and do their thing in terms of trying to get this person to a safer place. Um, but hospitalization is this kind of resort. Okay, if if I believe you're going to hurt yourself, the only way to protect you in the interest of, uh, of interest of your protecting yourself, I've got to deprive you of your freedom. I'm not going to put you in jail, but you will be hospitalized uh, and held uh, temporarily uh, against your will. Um, the other thing uh, you can do more broadly, I mean, with an individual, you know, educating them in terms of talking about, um, you know, what you know about suicide and what you know about mood disorders and that uh, most people aren't sad forever and that it does get better uh, in what you know about treatments and the possibility uh, of, of life getting better uh, is important. But then education uh, beyond that situation, just in general, uh, educating other people about the risk factors uh, of suicide and what to look for overall at a, at a community level can reduce uh, suicide rates. Um, and then not something necessarily for, for you to do, but other things that can be done uh, to help prevent suicide, uh, therapy uh, and medication. And and therapists do a lot of things like we've we've talked about, but also talking about the the, the reasons uh, why they've come to uh, this place where they're thinking about dying, talking about the reasons they might have to live, and depending on the theoretical orientation, doing a variety of different things. But so there's some therapy, and then there's no drug for medication. There's no drug to treat suicidality, but there are medications that can lift mood. And if mood is sufficiently lifted, uh, it may decrease the risk uh, of suicide. Um, I think that's one thing I should have mentioned before about uh, uh, in terms of assessment. If somebody you know has been uh, kind of talking about suicide and been very, very depressed, and then you see uh, a slight lift in their mood, uh, and they didn't go get therapy, they're not on any meds, but they're suddenly feeling a little bit better, that might be a risk factor. Um, sometimes when people who are profoundly depressed and they have that psychomotor ret retardation and just can't do anything, whenever they commit to the idea of killing themselves, they begin to feel better because they see my pain's going to end soon. And so that in slight increase in mood might be a signal of danger. It might be a signal that they're getting better, but it might also be a signal of, of danger. So if they're also, you know, talking about uh, giving their things away, hey, you can have my Xbox when I'm gone, uh, or, um, you know, telling their goodbyes to people as if they were going on a trip, 
that's a uh, increased risk as well. But again, uh, medications uh, can increase mood out of that danger zone to not necessarily make them happy, but uh, decrease the, the sadness and the pain enough that they can then get in therapy and work on some things uh, and figure out other choices other than, than hurting themselves. Okay, uh, so what causes uh, mood disorders? Uh, like everything, it's a combination of uh, biological, psychological, environmental factors. For the biological factors, um, genetics certainly seem to play a role. You know, the, the f there seems to be familial aggregation for uh, mood disorders, but it seems to be fairly non-specific. So it's not so much that you know, if someone in your family had major depression, you're going to have major depression. But if someone in your family had major depression, a first-degree relative, you're at a higher likelihood of having some mood disorder. Maybe major depression, maybe uh, uh, one of the bipolar disorders, maybe dysthymia. So there's some general vulnerability to uh, experiencing um, pathological moods, so experiencing uh, excessive or persistent uh, mood states that has some sort of genetic component, possibly. And again, familial, familial aggregation, just because it runs in family, doesn't mean it's hereditary. But we think it probably is to some degree has there's some hereditary uh, uh, nature to it. Um, and again, that's based on uh, twin studies and and family studies. But again, from based on the same studies, we know that it's it cannot be entirely genetic because we would see you know 100% uh, concordant traits for for identical twins, and it's nowhere near that. Uh, we see higher concordant rates, more familial aggregation for uh, the bipolar disorders, for ma experience of mania, than for uh, depression. So it's it's thought to be more genetic. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it tends to uh, run in families more, uh, certainly. Uh, beyond genetics, uh, we've talked before about the, the neuroendocrine system, the uh, hypopatu hypothalamic pituitary adrenal cortex uh, uh, axis, sorry, the HPA axis. Uh, and its role in the uh, the release of uh, cortisol. Um, one thing we know uh, about that, one of the reasons we know about the role of the HP axis in cortisol is because of uh, Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is not a mental disorder, it's a, a physical disease where people have problems with their pituitary, um, where they have a kind of overactive pituitary, which leads to too much cortisol. And people who have Cushing disease often uh, um, have high levels of depressive symptoms. Okay, So in this case we have this clear disease process that's causing too much cortisol and they look like people who have depression. So we suspect that cortisol plays a role in the HP axis um, is, the, is um, uh, coordinates the release of cortisol in response to you know inputs from other parts of the brain. Uh, so how you experience stress contributes to the use of cortisol, and that seems to be related to both anxiety and depression. So that's involved somehow, so too much cortisol, but again, we can't just suck out your cortisol and you feel better, because something was making you release the cortisol, and we suck the cortisol out. If that's something in life that's making you depressed doesn't change, you'll go back to releasing more cortisol. Uh, we also think the the thyroid uh, may play a role, which again, uh, the thyroid um, has uh, uh, some synaptic connections to the HP axis, uh, but we we suspect the thyroid plays a role because of um, symptoms of hypo hypothyroidism. Uh, people with hypothyroidism have insufficient thyroid thyroid uh, hormone, uh, and they look like they have depression, especially the, the vegetative or somatic symptoms uh, are often associated with, with hypothyroidism. Um, so uh, these pieces of the brain, we know because of the association between certain disease processes and these mood symptoms, that people that don't have those disease processes, they don't have cushion disease, don't have hypothyroidism, but they have those same behavioral, cognitive, somatic symptoms, we think, okay, well, those parts of their brain are probably involved uh, somehow. Not exactly sure how. Uh, and with neurotransmitters, uh, most of you probably know uh, serotonin, right, is important because we always hear about the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, and it is, but uh, so are norepinephrine uh, and dopamine and possibly others as well. And for, for any of these, it's, it's 
not so simple as a, a, a dearth or a, a lack of neurotransmitters. If you talk about, oh, well, you have a chemical imbalance, you don't have enough, you don't have enough serotonin, they need to give you something to increase your serotonin production, and you'll feel better. Not exactly. Um, if it were that simple, we would have come up with a cure for depression. Right? There would be no depression anymore, and the drugs would work on everybody. But they don't. Um, you know, we have a, a 50 percent response rate for uh, uh, for most SSRIs for depression, and that's not 50 percent people for any drug. That's for somebody trying uh, several drugs usually until they find the right one that works for them. And if it were just oh, more serotonin is good, then any drug that tr that treated serotonin would work equally well for everybody. And that's that's not the case. So it's it's a combination of influences of these neurotransmitters, um, and not just too much or or too little, but um, how they're transported, how they're moved around in the brain, um, how they're produced, uh, how they're processed, um, which uh, which type of receptor sites uh, are activated because. Uh, you know, there's for dopamine. You know, there's different type of dopamine receptors: D1, D2, D3, D4, uh, and on and on. Such that it's not as oh, dopamine fit is a key that fits in this lock. There's different locks that different types of dopamine uh, um, uh, attach to. So it's a uh, it's more complicated than I think most people would would prefer you to believe because it's it's easier to say oh, uh, not enough neurotransmitters or too much neurotransmitters. But unfortunately, uh, the reality is it's it's not that simple. But they are involved. Okay. Uh, so biological factors, genetics, um, the brain, neurotransmitters. In terms of uh, social, kind of environmental factors, uh, stressful life events uh, obviously uh, uh, play a big role. Uh, and it seems to be, as we'll, we'll see in a minute, we talk about psychological causes. The meaning given to stressful events is really important in terms of whether or not it's going to cause uh, a change in mood. Um, so the same thing happens to two different people. Uh, one is fine, the other gets depressed. Maybe it's because of genetic differences, maybe not. Maybe it's two identical twins experiencing the same event and they take it differently. To some degree, it may be because how they interpret that event. You know, is the you know the loss of a parent mean uh, it's the the end of the world and I'll never see this person again, or is it oh they've gone on to a better place and I'll I'll be so happy when I can when I can see them again and I'm so glad they're they're not feeling pain anymore. Right? Two different interpretations of the same event. Okay. Uh, for depression, stressful life events that lead to the experience of depression are typically uh, characterized by, by loss. Uh, loss of a loved one, uh, loss of uh, some accomplishment or achievement uh, or job, loss of an ability. Um, you know, people that uh, experience um, paralysis uh, following um, um, accidents frequently experience some depression afterwards because of the loss of their ability to to walk uh, and, and function in the same way that they could uh, before. Um, mania, inter interestingly, um, responds to different, seems to come in response to different stressful life events. Uh, and typically things uh, like uh, schedule disruption, but also goal attainment. So a scheduled disruption uh, might be somebody who um, you know works a, a normal uh, nine-to-five job and then goes to shift work and now their sleep-wake cycle is different, sometimes that can trigger uh, mania in individuals. And there may be something related to um, uh, melatonin and the, the sleep-wake cycle that affects mania. We don't know, but we know that disruptions in people's schedules, change, significant changes in people's schedule, sometimes will contribute to, to mania if they get out of their rhythms. So people that suffer from bipolar disorder, one of the uh, um, treatments, approaches, is to maintain a, a very consistent schedule and that seems to reduce the likelihood of recurrent manic episodes. Uh, but also goal attainment. Getting a promotion at work might contribute to the experience of mania. So feeling a little good, oh I got a promotion, might lead to feeling really good which then can possibly extend into uh, the experience of mania and, and the attendant um, disruption of, of life. Uh, and another social factor would be uh, lack of social support. Uh, so bad things, good things happen. And people that have higher levels of uh, social support, so people that uh, are around them, they can talk to, that care about them, seem to be in some ways insulated from stressful life events. Um, less likely to experience, uh, n not invulnerable, but less likely to experience 
significant mood disturbances when bad things happen if there are people uh, um, that they can um, interact with. In terms of psychological factors, uh, there seems to be a cognitive vulnerability, a certain style of thinking that's associated with uh, mood disorders, especially with depression. So one theorist that, that uh, discussed the ways in which people think that can, may contribute to uh, depression would be uh, Aaron Beck, and he developed uh, Beck's triad. Uh, and basically looking at people who were depressed and looking at how they think. Uh, and he found that uh, they tend to have uh, negative views of themselves, negative views of the, the world around them, and negative expectations for the future. So self, world, uh, and future. Um, and that's how I originally came up with the triad. And then since then, uh, that's been used to look at people who are at risk for developing depression, with the idea being that not only when you're depressed do you begin to think that way, but thinking that way can lead to the experience of depression. Uh, and furthermore, getting people to think differently who are depressed can lead them out of depression. Uh, another thing that's frequently looked at in terms of uh, depression would be cognitive distortions. Uh, uh, and this is based on the, the assumption that people who are, are depressed frequently have these uh, thoughts, sometimes uh, automatic thoughts. They don't even know that they're having them because they come uh, so quickly uh, into their mind, but uh, that are illogical. They're, they're, they're not rational. Um, things like overgeneralization, uh, black and white thinking, uh, personalization. Uh, personalization, to, to give an example, if uh, um, somebody's depressed and, and they're walking down the street and they see their friend on the other side of the street uh, and they wave and their friend doesn't wave back, they will personalize that. Okay, that means <coughs> that they hate me. I don't know what I did to them, but they, they were really mad at me and, and they hate me. God, this sucks. Right? That's not rational. That is one possible explanation for lightning wave. <coughs> Excuse me. But it's not the most likely. Um, and they believe with this kind of certitude um, that, yeah, that's why. And so, um, jumping ahead to treatment a little bit, one of the things you want to do is challenge that distortion. Okay, well, what's the evidence that the person hates you? Well, they didn't wave. Okay, is there any other reason why they may not have waved? Uh, I guess they might not have seen me. Okay, did they give any evidence that they saw you? No, they didn't even look up. Okay, if they didn't look up, how could they have seen you? Ah, yeah, that, that was illogical. Sorry. So, cognitive distortions are, are, are common uh, among people who are uh, depressed, and people who have more cognitive distortions might be at increased risk uh, for experiencing depression. <coughs> also, people uh, tend to have uh, an attribution style uh, in terms of how they explain uh, uh, negative events and, and positive events. And for depression, we focus mainly on uh, how they explain negative events or, or, or failures in their life. Uh, and we look at uh, the the locus of their attribution, of their explanation for why it happened. Uh, it's either internal or external. So I failed, and it's because of me, or it's because of uh, um, you know something unfair in the world or something in the environment. Uh, and look at the uh, uh, stability uh, of the, the, the cause. Oh, it happened, uh, and, it, and it's always going to be this way. Uh, nothing can change it. This, it will always happen this way. And then uh, if it's a global or uh, specific uh, cause. So, um, you know, I failed, and it's because uh, I, I, I'm a complete idiot at, at everything, which again is a bit of a cognitive distortion over generalization. And people that have, uh, when negative events happen, make internal, stable, global attributions. Um, you know, that relationship didn't work out, uh, and it's my fault. Um, it's because I'm unlovable, and I will always be unlovable. Thinking that way will, will make you feel bad, right? It'll make you feel depressed. Um, so, thinking is related to feeling. Um, we can demonstrate that a variety of ways. And so it's thought that uh, people who, are, uh, who develop tendencies to think in certain ways are at greater risk for, for experiencing uh, depression than um, those who, who think differently. Not as much in terms of uh, cognitive explanations for why people uh, experience uh, mania. Most of the explanations for experiencing mania uh, are more related to um, biological explanations and, and less to, to anything else. Um, but uh, interpersonal factors and social behavior um, 
depression might be related to social skill deficits. People who have uh, uh, poor social skills, um, they're not able to uh, share their emotions, they're not able to read other people's emotions. Uh, it might lead to relationship conflict, and relationship conflict typically leads to loneliness, and that contributes to depression. Um, also, withdrawal is often um, uh, synonymous with depression. People pull back uh, from others. And unfortunately, that seems to maintain uh, their depression. That kind of uh, isolating of oneself tends to make people more depressed than if they are, are, are forced or can force themselves to, to be around uh, others. Uh, and then if people are, are forced into uh, um, withdraw, uh, we know from like putting people into solitary confinement, can lead to experiences uh, very similar to uh, major depressive episodes. So pulling back from people for whatever reason might contribute to uh, the experience of uh, depression. That's right. uh, in terms of uh, treatment, uh, medications um, commonly used for uh, uh, talk about depression first, antidepressants. Uh, they're effective for about half the people who take them. And again, usually not the first time. Usually you have to take a couple until you figure out the one that works uh, right for you and your own uh, body chemistry. And works in terms of reduces symptoms uh, to a satisfactory level and has few enough side effects that are satisfactory to you. Uh, the different classes of, of antidepressants include uh, the tricyclics, like amipramine and, and amitriptyline, which are uh, tofranil and elevil, by the other names. Uh, and what they're thought to do is uh, block the reuptake of uh, um, several neurotransmitters, including uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. So not selective for just blocking serotonin, blocks a bunch of stuff, gets in the way. So keeps certain cells from firing. Uh, I'm sorry, keeps them from being um, taken back up from the, the presynaptic cell. So when that happens, there's more neurotransmitter in the synapse between two cells that are communicating with these chemicals. And when there's more in the synapse, more in the space, the other cell is going to fire longer. So it's causing more activity in, uh, uh, in certain cells. But ironically, it's thought to be effective by, by causing more activity. Eventually, the cell gets tired, uh, uh, to use a rough metaphor, and uh, and down regulation of neuronal transmission occurs. So by making them overactive, they become less active. So parts of your brain become less active because of these drugs, it's thought. Uh, the side effects, um, uh, cholinergic side effects, uh, blurred vision, dry mouth, constipation, uh, weight gain. Uh, many people um, uh, quit tricyx because of these. Some people can tolerate it well, others uh, can't. And, uh, because of side effects, one of the reasons that other uh, drugs were, were explored. But for some people that don't respond to the other drugs, they can still go back and use these, these older uh, tricyclics. For some people, they, they are effective if they can manage the, the side effects. Um, but you do need to be careful because uh, they're lethal uh, if, if you take too many. And if somebody is suffering from depression and having suicidal thoughts, you may not want to give them a pill that's lethal unless it's going to work in terms of uh, improving their mood. Uh, so you've got to be uh, careful about prescribing uh, tricyclics to somebody who uh, is depressed and suicidal. If they're depressed but not suicidal, then it might be uh, might be okay. The MAOIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, things like uh, Nardil, um, they block uh, the monoamine oxidase enzyme uh, that breaks down neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine, which means that uh, inst instead of... Uh, those things are getting broken down when they're floating in the synapse to be before they're before they can be reuptaken. They have to be processed and broken down, and this keeps them from being broken down. So again, they stay in the synapse longer, and again, it's thought to lead to down regulation of neuronal transmission. Um, so, making the brain work less in certain areas. Um, in terms of uh, uh, side effects, one of the things you have to be careful of is not consuming anything that includes uh, tyramine, so beer, cheese, uh, chocolate. Because, uh, again, uh, uh, it could kill you. It could be fatal if accidentally mis mixed or purposely mixed. So, again, I want to be careful about prescribing that. Uh, so those were kind of the early antidepressants. And then the SSRIs came out, and everybody thought, well, these are these are awesome. So we have SSRIs and SSNRIs. So uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. So serotonin stays in the synapse longer. 
and then SSNRI re- inhibits the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. So uh, things like uh, Prozac, uh, Cymbalta, uh, Effexor. Um, and depending on which theorist you read, some people say that um, uh, these things work by uh, allowing more serotonin in the synapse, increasing serotonergic activity, which is a good thing. Which increased serotonergic activity would be the opposite of down regulation <laughs> of neuron transmission. So they would seem to work in the opposite of the other drugs. But then uh, if you read other uh, uh, literature on the, the psychopharmacology, they say that no, no, it actually leads to down regulation uh, as well. Um, so blocks the reuptake of, of serotonin, but to what end? They honestly don't know. People will, will act as if they know. Uh, oh, it's down regulation. Oh, it's up regulation. Well, we don't know. There's more serotonin in the synapse. That's about as far as we can go for now uh, until we have some more longitudinal studies. Um, in terms of side effects, uh, decreased sexual desire and or sexual dysfunction for for uh, some of the drugs. Um, but uh, um, when I talk to people about um, antidepressants uh, in the the field of, of treating uh, disorders with medications, these medications can be very helpful for people in terms of uh, reducing symptoms. They're not a cure for a disorder, but they can reduce symptoms and restore some level of functionality. Uh, but they're usually short-term fixes uh, because your body adapts to drugs, and also people just don't take drugs forever. You can, people get tired of taking a pill every day, uh, especially if, if it's not something if they, if they know that it's not going to kill them to not take the pill. They won't take it uh, every day. But they're good for restoring functioning uh, for a time. Um, even if we don't know uh, why they work, we know that they do seem to work uh, for, again, at least half the people. Um, and, but I think one of the most interesting things, as we've talked about the anxiety disorders already, is that these antidepressants also seem to be anti-anxiety drugs and anti-eating disorder drugs and anti-everything drugs which really should point to point out to you clearly that they have no idea what's going on with these drugs. Uh, hopefully someday they will, but right now they, they don't. In terms of medical treatments uh, for bipolar disorder, uh, lithium is the, the frontline uh, uh, treatment. If you give somebody with bipolar disorder an antidepressant, uh, it could induce a manic episode, um, and that may not be good uh, for them. So they don't... Uh, um, typically take antidepressants. There are some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but usually it's uh, lithium, which is a, a mood stabilizer. So you don't feel uh, as sad, but you also don't feel as happy. You don't get the mania anymore, uh, which is one reason people uh, don't like taking it, because they like their mania, and lithium takes, takes that away. Uh, unfortunately, it's toxic at high levels, so when you're on lithium, you have to get your uh, blood checked regularly to make sure uh, it's not killing you. Uh, and even less than SSRIs, I really don't know how, how lithium works. Uh, there's opinions on it, but nobody knows uh, for certain. Uh, you know, it's it's a salt, is what it is, and we don't know why this salt causes um, uh, people to have less extreme moods. Uh, other options uh, other than lithium, uh, other salts, things like uh, sodium valproate, uh, sometimes uh, atypical antipsychotics. Um, so some of the newer antipsychotics, uh, like uh, um, Seroquel, are used to treat bipolar disorder, uh, and interestingly enough, anticonvulsants uh, sometimes used um, things like uh, um, uh, carbamazepine, car carbam CBZ, uh, which you don't you're not drugs that were developed basically for people with epilepsy, and if you have bipolar disorder, you don't have epilepsy, but for some unknown reason, these drugs seem to reduce the frequency of manic episodes somehow reducing brain activity in some way, they don't know. Uh, and sometimes, uh, and usually this is kind of psychiatric experimenting, sometimes these people uh, with bipolar disorder that are on a combination of uh, antidepressants and some anticonvulsants. So the antidepressant to uh, treat the depression, but then the anticonvulsant to keep them from becoming manic in response to the antidepressant. Uh, and then a variety of other combinations might also uh, be used. Um, people, again, the drugs are kind of the um, 
first uh, first realm of uh, attack for medical treatments for people who are non responders who don't respond to to the drugs um, for major depressive uh, disorder, they might receive electroconvulsive therapy uh, shock therapy um, you know they don't call it shock therapy more because it sounds scary so e c t sounds sounds more medical um, it is effective for about fifty percent of people who don't respond to uh, the drugs, which is is pretty good. Um, it also seems to work for people with uh, psychotic features uh, fairly well. Uh, it's a little different than the way they used to do it. Now uh, you'll take muscle relaxers or some other anesthetic, you know, so you don't uh, uh, break all the bones in your body as they're applying electrical current uh, to your brain. Uh, and it's not just once; it's multiple administrations. Uh, I think around ten is the average number. Uh, in terms of side effects, it may affect uh, memory. Um, some short-term memory loss, um, uh, some uh, some amnesia, which for many people goes away, for some people doesn't. Uh, unfortunately, even though it works for 50% of the people who are non-responders, there's a fairly high relapse rate. So it may work short-term, which these are people who, you know, they're going to kill themselves if you don't do something, and this can treat them and get them better so they're not killing themselves. But unfortunately, often for only a couple of months, and then they, they relapse and be, they become uh, very depressed again. Uh, and like the medications, the, the mechanism is unknown. Why, why does it seem to help some people to have electrical current pass through their brain? We don't know. It's like hitting the... When you're, you can't figure out how to fix your computer, and you push the power button and hold it down to force it to turn off and then turn it back on, and it works. You don't know why it works, but it did. That's, that's ECT. And then uh, TMS, um, transcranial magnetic stimulation, um, has been developed as an alternative to ECT, uh, where you uh, um, it's magnetic stimulation, where a magnetic coil is placed over the head, and localized electromagnetic pulses are aimed at certain parts of the brain. So instead of shooting you with electricity, we shoot you with electromagnetic uh, radiation. And the effectiveness is similar to ECT, about half the people who are non-responders. Um, side effects include uh, headaches, uh, less memory loss. In terms of why it works for some people, we don't know, but it seems to be associated with uh, uh, cerebral blood flow. So getting the juices going in the brain. Why that may make you less depressed, we don't know. But they've observed increased cerebral blood flow. Okay, um, last couple things about uh, psychological treatments. Uh, the effectiveness uh, um, for uh, depression, uh, similar to, to medications uh, with uh, for major depressive disorder, but not with uh, with bipolar disorder. Uh, rarely we see people um, receive psychological treatment without um, medication. With bipolar disorder, it's usually a combination of medication and psychotherapy. Uh, depression might be a combination, might be just one or the other. Um, but uh, what you'll see with, with either one really would be uh, possibly uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's one type of, of therapy. It involves uh, identifying and challenging cognitive distortions like we talked about earlier. So the idea being that uh, mood and emotion responds to thinking. So learning to think differently will help you feel differently. Um, and the whole process is one of uh, collaborative hypothesis testing. So it's going in not so much uh, like you think of uh, people going in to see Freud and laying on the couch and he's the expert and I will tell you what to do. But CBT has this attitude of um, let's come together and you've got this problem. Let's try to figure out um, what's wrong. Let's figure out some possible solutions and then we'll test them together. You know, So okay, well I'll help you record the data and we'll see. You'll try this new way of thinking and behaving, so cognitive and behavioral and we'll see if you feel better. If not, we'll try something else. But we're going to come up with this stuff together, and we're going to figure it out. Not that you come in and I tell you exactly how to feel better. We're going to see what works for you. We've got a whole armament of possible strategies. We'll see which ones uh, work for you. Um, so like I said, there's a cognitive component. There's also that behavioral uh, component in terms of uh, behavioral assignments. You know, talked before about withdrawals associated with depression. So one thing that... Uh, CBT therapist that has kind of a behavioral bent may do is tell you to do things that depressed people don't do. Go to parties. Go try to have fun. And if you put yourself in social social situations, your emotions may follow your behaviors. Right. So usually we think of okay, when I'm feeling good, 
I want to be around people. But the behavior says, if you can be around people, you will feel better. Uh, here's uh, an example of one tool that CBT therapists and cognitive therapists uh, might use called a, a thought chart. Um, it helps identify cognitive distortions uh, and uh, generate rational responses. So you have people first identify their cognitive distortions. Uh, and this is the first assignment. Uh, and uh, like I said before, frequently they're kind of automatic negative thoughts. Um, so you have to identify what those are, and then you do some work talking about that, and then you can go to this next part in terms of developing rational responses. So uh, for a typical scenario, you have someone, okay, think about some time whenever you felt uh, depressed or guilty or overwhelmed or embarrassed or whatever. So write down what, em what emotion it was and then how bad did you feel. So zero to 100. Oh, it felt horrible. I was so sad or I was so embarrassed or whatever. Okay, now describe the situation. What were you doing? What were you thinking? You know, what happened right before you felt that way? And then, what were your thoughts? Right, so, oh, I was, they said this and I felt sad. What were you thinking? Well, well, I thought I was sad because they said this. No, you didn't think you were sad. You felt sad. What did you think? You know, oh, I thought they didn't like me. Or, uh, I thought uh, it would never get any better. Right, so there's some thought there. And you also want to say, you know, I felt like it would never get any better. No, you didn't feel like it would never get any better. You felt sad. You don't feel thoughts. You think thoughts and you feel feelings. So you thought it would never get any better. And you make that distinction because you don't challenge people's feelings. You felt that way and that's honest and genuinely how you felt. Fine. But you might be thinking crooked and we can talk about that. We can argue about whether or not what you thought was rational. I can't argue whether or not your feelings are rational. Your feelings are your feelings. So you felt sad, but let's talk about what you thought. You thought this. Okay, so you thought uh, it will never get any better. Tap into that rational part of yourself. How would you respond to yourself if you go back in time? Uh, well, I guess it might get better. You know, Here are the reasons why uh, it, it might get better. There's no evidence that uh, it will always be this way. Here's the reason it happened this one time. Okay, so now you have this rational response. Tell that to yourself. Now... Uh, how strongly do you believe this rational thought? Well, I don't really believe it. I said it to myself. I don't really believe it. How do you feel? Well, I feel a little better. Still not that good. The idea being that the more you can generate these rational responses and the more you can believe them, the better you'll feel. And if you can identify this uh, association between rational thought and positive feelings, you'll become more rational and feel better. Uh, so it's kind of the thrust of CBT uh, with, uh, with depression. Um, other approaches, interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, focuses, as the name implies, on relationships. So the idea being that you, you resolve problems in current relationships um, to make the depression better, with the assumption being that the depression is a symptom of a relational problem uh, and, and not the other way around. Uh, and also, it might involve learning to form healthier adaptive relationships. So because of early experiences, you might never have figured out how to be in a healthy, loving relationship. And you're in this kind of toxic relationship, and it makes you sad and depressed. But yeah, you're in a crappy relationship. You should be sad and depressed. So we're not going to you know, tell you not to feel bad. It, you should feel bad. But your feeling bad should be a signal to you to make this relationship better or different or find another one. And so we're going to talk about how to do that, you know, working on those uh, interpersonal uh, issues. Um, and there are a variety of other treatments. Um, that's just kind of two of the big ones. Um, other issues in treatment uh, relevant to uh, bipolar disorder. And the stuff with depression is relevant to bipolar disorder in terms of their experience of major depressive episodes. Right? Not so much in relevant to their experience of, uh, of mania. In relevance to their experience of mania, in treatment you focus on medication adherence. Take your, take your, uh, take your pills. You know, and talk about why you don't want to take your pills and what's going to happen if you don't take your pills. Well, uh, I don't want to take them because I don't get to feel good and I feel numb. So then you got to talk about that. Okay, well, uh, what is numb? What is normal feeling? Are you able to feel happy? And maybe, maybe not. Maybe they have to find a different drug. But you have to talk about finding some medication that, that, can, uh, that they can take reliably uh, if they have kind of this chronic reoccurring mania to keep them safe. Uh, and the other thing that seems to help is, uh, for uh, bipolar disorder, is family therapy. Um, depression as well, but especially for bipolar disorder, in terms of educating other people in the family about 
bipolar disorder, and um, improving uh, the interactions in the family can decrease uh, some of the negative life events that might contribute to experiences of mania or depression in someone uh, with bipolar disorder. Okay, uh, we've covered a, lot, covered a lot of ground today. Um, talked about uh, major depressive disorder, the bipolar disorders, the thymia, cyclothymia. Uh, you have a good idea of the diagnostic criteria, right? If you, if you know the m criteria for the mood episodes, you know the difference between the different disorders. Um, causes, biological, psychological, social, uh, treatment, um, a combination usually of uh, medication and, and therapy. Um, and mood disorders typically are responsive to treatment uh, if the person is motivated enough and the therapist is, is skilled enough. Um, so these are things that we think of as uh, treatable. And we don't talk about curable, we talk about treatable. We can help you to learn and think in new ways and we can give you drugs that can change your feelings for a while, but it's not going to cure you. You know, you, you're not going to never be depressed again, you're not going to never be manic again. Right. We can de decrease the likelihood of future episodes, and we can make the impact of the episodes uh, less severe, and you'll have less severe mood symptoms. But you can't go to therapy or take a pill and be happy for the rest of your life. Um, and you probably wouldn't want that either. It'd be kind of a, a boring life. Okay, uh, that's it for now. Take care.